Oh boy, Nikita, you just opened up a can of worms. Now, we'll go to the Nikita Zadorov comments a little bit later in this video, but we did have a lot of Canucks stuff that happened today and extra conversations that we could go over, starting out with the news that Thatcher Demko has been placed on the LTIR retroactively and forward Arshdeep Baines has been recalled from the Abbotsford Canucks. Now, this isn't really the most amazing thing to hear right off the bat. Not that Arshdeep Baines has been called up, but that Thatcher Demko is on the LTIR. You hear that and you say, oh, wait a minute, long-term injury reserve. Wait a minute, Demko. No, he's out for a while. Rick Dollywall goes out there and calms everything down. This just means that Demko can't play until April 6, and it gives them more cap space in the meantime. It's also to make cap space for the Baines call-up, drama queen, so everybody freaking out about Thatcher Demko being placed on the LTAR, this is fine. This is just a move to save some cap space on a guy who wasn't even going to be playing anyway. So Demko already being out, why not put him on the LTAR, save a little bit of extra dollars because you're not going to be having that salary on your book whilst he is on the IR. So this is okay. And in fact, we had some extra comments that Taka confirmed the move to put Demko on LTR was cap-related so that they would have room to recall players. Taka also said that Demko's timeline has not changed and that he isn't concerned that six games won't be enough for him to get sharp. Asked about a timeline, Taka says, I think there's a date, but I don't have a hard date right now. There is a game plan. So essentially, Tockett went out there and confirmed that the Demko LTAR thing doesn't really change anything, it just makes the Canucks spend less. So this is a pretty good move for everybody involved. For Thatcher Demko, it doesn't change his recovery time. My only question is, if they had to figure this out, like, oh, Demko being on the LTAR will help them save money, and it's not like his injury timeline recovery period hasn't changed, why didn't they just do this sooner? Could they have not saved a little bit more money by putting him on the LTIR, let's say, two days ago? I don't know, that's just an extra thought. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to understand the cap more than Emily Castonguay does, but uh, that is just a thought that I had in my mind in regards to this. But also, when it comes to Rick Tockett and today's practice, we had some extra notes that really make things interesting, because we did see Archdeep Baines get called up. He was in a 13th forward role alongside of Phil DiGiuseppe, but we also had the news that Dakota Joshua is indeed back in a regular practice line. He was playing with Miller and Besser, which is very interesting because the remainder of that crazy third line still is going to be spread out. You had Garland sticking around with Pedersen and Hoglander, so talk it's not breaking up that line. Teddy Bluger is with Mikheyev and Lafferty, so maybe not a lot of offense is going to come out of this line, unless, of course, Lafferty starts scoring amazing goals like he did against the LA Kings. And then put Coles and Suter and Alman as your fourth line. Very, very interesting decision to keep these three, Joshua, Bluger, and Garland, all separated. Even though they're all back and fully fledged in the lineup, the garland pedersen Hoglander line was working so well that they didn't want to break this up. So Rick Tockett, props to that. We'll see how Joshua plays with Miller and Besser. That's going to be crazy. Of course, if Joshua actually ends up returning. If he doesn't return, then okay, this entire practice doesn't really seem to have accomplished anything. But D pairings are pretty much the same as we're used to. Hughes, Hronik, Susie, Myers, Adorov, Cole, and then Friedman and Juleson. Seems like these two guys, Juleson and Cole, are rotating around in that final spot on defense. And that may just be the way they roll into the postseason. Included is a picture of the UBC practice from earlier this morning, which was great. We also had ourselves another tweet. This was posted by MD. Target is heated on the drawing board right now. We have 10 effing games left. We gotta effing focus. And there's the guys right there, still at UBC. Can you just go watch practice at UBC? And MD says, yeah. Did he actually say this? He says, yeah. So let's just take this guy's word for it. Rick Tockett really trying to get it into his guys that, yeah, all that intensity y'all played with at the beginning of the season, which allowed you to score 8, 7, 10 goals a game. Just do that again. We gotta get dialed in here. 10 games left. This is the time for Vancouver to lock in. We've seen what happens in the past when they don't end up locking in, when they kind of lose themselves towards the end of a really good season. You have years like the LA Kings year in 2012, where the Canucks ended up losing in a pretty ridiculous fashion to a Kings team that was 
the eighth seed. But another thing to note in regards to the practice, and you might have noticed this earlier, was that you didn't have any Elias Lindholm suiting up in practice. Miller, Pedersen, Bluger, Suter, all on those center positions, but no Lindholm to be seen. And in fact, you had Pia Suter taking part of the power play one, alongside of Miller, Besser, Pedersen, and Hughes. So, Really interesting to see Suter get that opportunity. Honestly, I haven't really liked him that much in that spot, but we'll see whether or not this is able to get good results as the days go on. Dakota Joshua also talked about whether or not he'd be able to play. He said possibly. I'm not sure yet. We'll talk about it and see how the morning goes. Furthermore, to Elias Lindholm, there was a conversation brought up by Arpen. If Lindholm is done for the year, there better be a review of whether the Flames provided a damaged player and what medical information the Canucks were given. Agreed. His game has been off all year, even before the trade. And this is one of those things where you have to sort of think about it like, okay, Lindholm was off to see a specialist. He's dubbed day-to-day -day right now, and there was some sort of an injury that he was playing through, which kind of plagued the way he was able to play. I'm not gonna say, like, oh, it's a movement thing, oh, it's a hands thing, oh, it's whatever. Like, we don't know much about Elias Lindholm and the injury that he had sustained, but all we do know is that his... Returns ever since the trade have not been great. Nine points, 22 games played. He really has not been up to snuff in comparison to what people thought he'd be able to do. And now learning that there was some sort of an injury that had hurt him that caused him to be day-to-day -day now, it kind of begs the question, okay, was this a product of Lindholm's time in Vancouver? Was he already hurt when he made his way over here? What's the deal with that? There could be some sort of a bigger conversation to have, but for now, you know, everybody's just kind of holding back and trying to see what's going on. However, when it comes to the big thing that a lot of Canucks fans are buzzing about from earlier today, this is an article published by Ian McIntyre this morning on Sportsnet. It goes over a comment made by Nikita Zadorov in regards to playing against the LA Kings. It's the King's goal to not play hockey and not let the other team play hockey, pretty much. Yeah, it's hard to come back, especially down to goals. So Zadorov is calling out the Kings for their 1-3-1 strategy, and the article has pretty much the same stuff here. The Canucks get King's best effort in a potential playoff preview. If you scroll over to the Zadorov comments, I mean, it's their system, Zadorov said. They don't really make plays. They just rim the puck and sit back all game. I mean, it's their goal to not play hockey and not let the other team play hockey pretty much. Yeah, it's hard to come back, especially when you're down two goals. They had one extra bounce than we did today, so that was the difference out there. There are some other comments from players like Miller and everybody else. Rick Tockett had some stuff, but realistically, this is Nikita Zadorov calling out the LA Kings for the system that they play. And the funny part is, I saw a lot of Kings fans getting really pissed off about this. I saw a lot of Kings fans laughing out loud about this. Hey, we still beat you guys, whatever, whatever. Like, yeah, that's the thing. Like, Nikita Zadorov's admitting they had one extra bounce, so that was the difference. They won the game, but they play boring hockey. They sit back and they rim the puck all day. They don't really do much their hockey is so low event and it's always why people say that the la kings games are the most boring ones to watch because i mean nothing really happens even the game against vancouver the other day the shots on goal were so little i mean if we go over to it where is that game over here here it is, Vancouver, LA. Take a look at the shots on goal. LA had 19, the Vancouver Canucks had 23. And it was like that for the majority of the game, even in the first period. I mean, singular digit shot totals for each of these teams in each of these three periods. That is not fun at all. So Nikita Zadorov, I'll say that he has a point in regards to calling out the Kings in their system, but you can let me know your thoughts in the comment section below how accurate you think these comments are as well. What are your opinions on the other things? Patrick Alvin announcing that Demko's on the LTAR, Arshdeep Baines has been recalled. What are your thoughts on Dakota Joshua potentially returning? What are your thoughts on Elias Lindholm not being present at practice and Suter getting his power play spot? What are your thoughts on Rick Taka telling the team to dial in? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below about the state of the Vancouver Canucks right now, I hope you enjoyed this video. Show us 99 and bye.